I want to stress that things like industrial, organizational, and human factor psychology can be used in many different types of occupational settings. It can be used in governments and in police forces and in education and in sports, but we're actually going to talk about how psychology outside of industrial, organizational, and human factors is used in some specific applied ways. So everything we've talked about up to now can be used in almost any workforce or any public setting. But now we're going to talk about four distinct settings that have done their own to move forward and to use psychology to flourish. And the first one we're going to talk about is forensics. Forensic psychology is massive. Again, we do offer an advanced course all about forensic psychology at the 400 level. And this can take many different sub areas. One such area of forensic psychology is the understanding of court dynamics. This is the idea of not just lawyers and how to make persuasive opening statement or closing statement, but also the social psychology and cognitive psychology of how the courtroom works. How do jurors perceive what's happening? What types of opening and closing statements are more likely to sway a jury? And even what type of presentation of the defendant or the plaintiff is going to persuade the jury? How many of the public show up? Just an example could be if lots of people show up and sit on the defendant's side of the courtroom or the plaintiff's side of the courtroom or both or neither, that can change the jury's outcome. And so some simple things like that can really change our perceptions of right or wrong or accountable or not. We also know there's a lot of psychology used in eyewitness testimony. Memory is extremely flawed. And so having experts and forensic experts to testify whether eyewitness te testimony is, is considered to be accurate or trustworthy or, or valuable or not is very essential. So understanding how the courtroom works and how proceedings can change can really help lawyers to understand how best to advocate for their, for their clients. And it can really help us to understand how we navigate the justice system. But that's not all. We also know that there is the study of criminology, which sometimes overlaps quite a lot with psychology. And this can be the study of understanding criminal minds, the understanding of how a criminal can be motivated and can carry out their criminal acts. What are the predictors that make someone turn into a criminal? What are the ways we can catch a criminal? What are the more common tactics and procedures and how do they think about it? We know this is an area that's made lots of pop culture movies and lots of pop culture TV shows in understanding these criminal minds. It's also the idea of understanding young criminals and the youth criminal justice system. What would motivate a young person and how can we prevent that? And if they are a young person entering the justice system, what are the special vulnerabilities we have to consider? What are the things that we need to protect them against so they don't become worse and instead we can rehabilitate them? And rehabilitation is also a major part of forensic psychology. It's the idea that we want to see what is actually going to make people improve and fit back into society. How can they rehabilitate themselves? This is the idea of the promotion of restorative justice rather than punitive justice. So as forensic psychology cannot be understated, it's absolutely massive. And one area that's sort of related but different is the area of military psychology. So much like a detective in a police force using psychology to track a killer, we also see this in military psychology. And military psychology has been doing this for longer and has been doing this in a much more advanced way. Strategy and psychological strategy in military is a massive industry. We can see this when we combine combat with intelligence and counterinsurgency intelligence. This is the idea of trying to understand when we still had infantry in the First World War, for instance, understanding the psychology of how to best be tactical in war. And now it's more about how to track and understand a threat, how to understand things that are coded online, and how, how to track what's going on. This is the idea that we may have a person who's a photographer and not a psychologist but they take really high detailed, high definition infrared photos. And those photos can be used by a psychologist to track clues and to interpret an enemy's behavior or a threat's behavior. It's also the idea that once there is a target, we can use psychologists to profile them, to understand their motivations, much like a police force would, and to understand how to best interrogate or spy on them. If you think of a spy work, it's amazingly psychological, understanding the emotions and the facial recognitions and how to use the tones and how to come across in a very social way. And that's a lot of social psychology, too. So there is a there is a ton of psychology in military work. Aside from just dealing with enemies and dealing with threats, military also use psychology in the recruitment and the morale of their teams. 
it might look a lot different than how we look at industrial psychology for let's say a government office or a school board but if you think about military psychology the idea that there is the sunk cost fallacy or the justification of effort through the recruitment and then there's the bonding and so how you build up the team morale and how you do the survival training all uses military psychology a big part of military psychology that I'm most familiar with because of some of my colleagues have worked in this area though is more about supporting military personnel, supporting veterans, and supporting military families. And that's because there is a lot of psychological hazards in working in the military. Not only is there combat fatigue and PTSD, but there's also a lot of transitions. Military families have to move around a lot. And the spouses and the children of military officers often experience a lot of adjustment issues in those constant separations, reunions, and moves. And so helping them to talk about things, to talk about the transitions they face, to offer them psychological services and counseling is a major important part of our veterans affairs and in taking care of our military personnel. So the military might not seem like an obvious choice if you study psychology, but psychology can actually take you really far in the military. 